I'm Cheryl State Bryson, mom, divorcee, health nut, and host of the Healthy Mom After Divorce podcast, where I help divorce moms get healthy, create financial stability, and develop emotional fortitude while they master co-parenting their kids. The place is here, and your time is now. So let's do this. Healthy Mamas, welcome to the 11th episode of the Healthy Mom After Divorce podcast. As always, you can find the full transcript for this episode at healthymomafterdivorce.com slash 11. So I'd like to start this episode with a little bit of background about me. Growing up, I was not what you would consider an athletic person. Sports have never come easy to me, so as a result, I was often picked last for teams in gym class. My confidence was really low in this respect, so I didn't try out for many of the varsity teams either. It seems as though so much of our culture is wrapped up in playing sports, and being athletic is always desired, so it was something I wished I was better at, but simply wasn't. In my early teens, however, I started asking about buying healthier foods at home. I would talk to my mom about how we could eat better and ask to buy certain foods and replace some of our staples with better alternatives. I may not have been an athlete per se, but being healthy was important to me at an age when it's the last thing on most kids' minds. When it came time to go to university, I considered many options, but what pulled me the most was human kinetics, which is the study of human movement, performance, and function. Most of the students in this program had been previously involved in athletics, and many were on varsity teams and part of intramural clubs, but not me. Although sport was something a lot of these students had in common, human movement and health meant something different for me even if I wasn't totally sure what that was yet. After I completed my undergrad degree, I then took an advanced certificate in athletic therapy, where I studied injuries so that people and athletes could return to a healthy life. So when you're dealing with injuries, there are three main phases. The first phase is the acute phase, where an injury has just happened and you're doing things like splinting and icing and just kind of trying to get through the initial stage to a more stable place. The second phase is when you're doing specific rehabilitation of the injury, like stretching, massage, mobility exercises, and pain management. Lastly, You're working with the person to help prevent future injury so that they can return to normal life and, in some cases, return to sport or work. This phase will often include fitness and strength training and stretching, and it's often started during phase two and just becomes more intense in phase three once the injury is fully healed. Now, it's easy for most people to see the advantages to phase one and phase two, You know, if you trip and sprain your ankle, it makes sense to first immobilize it, ice it, and keep weight off of it. And then it makes sense to go see an athletic therapist or physiotherapist to help you decrease swelling, manage pain, and gain mobility. And it also makes sense to do those stretches and band exercises you're given, you know, so you can get back to weight bearing and walk normally again and return to life as you knew it. But what happens with most of us when our ankle heals and the pain goes away? Do we continue with our exercises to keep our ankles strong to help prevent it from happening again? Or do we stop them and forget about them since, well, it doesn't hurt anymore? For a lot of us, we go with the latter, don't we? The pain is stopped and the mobility has returned, so we're done, right? Mm, I wouldn't be so sure. The thing is, we suffer injuries all the time, small ones and big ones. Some of them need specific treatment, but most go away on their own. Now, you might be assuming that I'm referring only to physical injuries, but I'm actually not. I'm also referring to emotional and mental injuries that cause pain, and sometimes a great deal of pain. Think of the sting of not being invited to an event that others you know God invites to. Think of the negative judgment of a teacher when you fail a test. 
Think of the hurtful things your ex might have said to you during your marriage or your divorce. Think of the unkind things you say to yourself when you look in the mirror. These are all injuries that we suffer on a regular basis. They may not be on the outside, but they're there nonetheless. So what do we do about them? Well, for larger injuries, we seek specific treatment, right? If we're suffering from trauma or anxiety or depression, just as examples, we go to professionals like therapists, counselors, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists. They're all there to help us with something specific, and they're well-trained to do so. But what about the smaller ones? What about the ones where we don't need specific treatment, but rather an overall sense of health so we can handle things as they come our way? This is where exercise and health speaks to me. Although I didn't know it at the time I was in university, this really is where my passion for being healthy lies. Not in sport, but in emotional and mental health. So after I finished my athletic therapy certificate, I worked as a personal trainer for about a year. There I learned even more about physical fitness and specifically strength training. But what I also noticed was the impact the regular physical activity was having on the client's mental and emotional states. After that period of my life, I took a hiatus from the health and fitness industry for about 10 years when I worked as a legal assistant. This is also during the time period that I was married. During this time, not only did I leave the industry, I also personally exercised very irregularly and There's lots of reasons for that that I won't get into right now. But after my divorce, when I was at my lowest and everything felt out of my control, I realized I needed to turn my focus to things I could control. And one of those things was exercise. Problem is, it never starts easily. In fact, if you're like me and most of the planet, it is insanely difficult to get yourself going, isn't it? Getting your shoes on to go for a run or dragging yourself to the gym requires a lot of mental drive, and overcoming the list of reasons your brain gives you not to go is very difficult. But once you do go, your brain quickly shifts to feeling pretty good, and the feeling of pride afterwards can't be beat. Now, we all know the physical benefits of regular exercise, so I'm not going to get into those here. But even knowing those benefits, if you're like me, they're not always enough to get me moving. Even someone like me who spent years in the industry needs more than heart health and toned legs as reasons to keep me coming back for more every day. I have learned so much from exercise that has helped me navigate my high conflict divorce and co-parenting situation, and I want to share all of it with you. This is how we take care of these minor injuries with just general health. Now, everyone has their favorite types of exercise. Mine is strength training, but if that's not your jam, that's totally fine. These lessons apply to every form of exercise and activity, walking, hiking, cycling, running, yoga, whatever it is you like to do. Okay, so let's get into this. I have six things that keep me going back to the gym every day. Number one, I have learned to control my breath. Now, anyone who's been through a divorce, especially a high conflict one, knows that reactivity to difficult things can be a big problem. It leads us to do and say irrational things. It can lead us to make poor choices that are generally not helpful. And one of the ways we are taught to regulate our nervous systems in these situations is to focus on our breathing. During exercise, controlling our breathing is pivotal for performance as well as safety. It gives our body the oxygen it desperately needs, and it teaches us to focus on our breath while doing something that causes stress. So although it's easy and very natural for us to hold our breath when we're, say, pushing a heavy weight or holding a pose, learning how to breathe through it is imperative in order to get through it safely. This is the same for emotional and mental stress. 
learning how to breathe our way through reactivity and stress in the face of nasty communication, mediations, our kids' struggles, or court appearances is imperative in order to move through these safely. Number two, I have learned to tolerate discomfort. When we are exercising with any amount of intensity, we will experience a certain amount of discomfort. The discomfort will vary depending on the exercise and how hard we're pushing ourselves, our fitness levels, our injuries, but it's always there and it always comes. And by definition, the discomfort is, well, uncomfortable. But no one gets through life without discomfort. It's almost daily in some form, isn't it? And if you're going through a divorce or co-parenting in a high-conflict environment, you probably feel even more discomfort. So learning how to tolerate it is crucial to your survival and your ability not to descend into black holes of helplessness and desperation every time something else happens. And if you're going through a divorce right now or dealing with post-separation abuse, you will know that tolerance for discomfort is a must-have. Number three, it makes me feel strong and capable. Now, this one is really important. So much of what we deal with is a mental game. So feeling strong in the face of a challenge is as important or maybe even more important than actually being strong. We have seen time and time again, people overcome things that we didn't think they could. When I'm lifting weights, I feel strong. But when it comes time to up the weight, I often have a bit of doubt. Can I lift it? Is it too heavy? Is it beyond my capability? But I do feel strong. So I'm able to remind myself that I've overcome that doubt before so I can overcome it again. I am reminded how capable I am, which gives me the mental strength to take one more step, climb one more rung, move forward that tiny little bit. After all, forward is forward. I can type one more email in a civil way. I can have another four-way meeting with my ex, his lawyer, and mine in order to negotiate our divorce. I can resist the temptation to say negative things about my ex. I can pull myself together after seeing my kids hurt by their other parent. I really can, because I've done it before. Number four, I have learned to believe in small incremental change. Anyone who has exercised before knows that results are not immediate. We may want them to be, but hopping on a treadmill once is not going to give us the results we're looking for. When it comes to exercise, you will not see changes day to day, but that doesn't mean changes aren't happening. I know we are visual creatures and we want to see every result right away, but we don't get to. Sometimes changes take time. In fact, most of the time they do. So we need to learn how to tolerate not seeing changes every day and trusting that they are happening over time. So after one run on the treadmill, you will not see or feel much different. But what about after six months? I'm guessing if you took photos before and after six months, the changes would be visible. This goes for anything related to health, whether it's exercise, healthy eating, meditating, stretching, whatever. The changes are small, incremental, and often invisible in real time. But if you zoom out and look at six months, a year, five years, over your lifetime, the changes are massive. So learning not needing to see with your eyes every single day in order to keep going is so important. Every time you have another mediation, every time you don't send a reactive email, every time you learn to distract yourself when you worry about your kids when they're not with you, every time you choose to skip the fast food, every time you take the high road and be the better parent, even though it's so hard, Every time you accept that your difficult co-parenting situation is not fair and never will be without getting angry with the world, you are making small incremental changes that will build over time. It will get easier, 
And every time you make these choices and take another step, you move forward in a positive direction. And when you falter, and you will, when you miss a workout, you know, or three, or when you send a reactive email, or when you throw a tantrum because you don't want to let go of the healthy co-parenting fantasy, that's okay. In the fitness industry, we tell people all the time, just like it takes a long time and regular healthy choices to get fit and healthy, it also takes a long time to undo it all. A few missed workouts, a fast food burger here and there, a birthday weekend where you had a few extra drinks is not going to undo all your hard work. It's the same in your divorce. Your small incremental changes will build despite any missteps along the way. Remember, you're playing the long game, not a short game. Number five, I have learned that I can do things I didn't think I could. This one happens every single time I push myself a little bit. I look at the weight I've selected or I think about the spin class I just pulled up and think, no way. There is no way I can do this. It's not me. And then I try and do it. Just the other day, we took the kids to a high ropes course. Standing on these really high platforms, and I mean like 60 plus feet in the air, looking at the obstacles in front of us, all of us thought at some point, there is no way I can do this. But just like in life, and in our divorce and co-parenting life, there's no way to go but forward. Up on that course, you can't go back. You can't go down. And in reality, you are actually safe in your harness. You won't fall. But your brain tells you, no way you can do that. It does that because it's trying to keep you safe. But once you're able to push yourself past that initial doubt, and often that's because you have no choice, you end up doing it. And that feeling after, the one where you just proved yourself wrong, is amazing. And is another reminder that sometimes our instinct around our abilities is just not correct. When you are facing another meeting with your lawyer, when you have to send another email to your ex that you know won't go well, when you have to attend a sporting event with your co-parent and their new partner, when you miss your kids so much it hurts, when you lay your head down at night and tell yourself that you don't think you can do another day. Remember the other times you did something you didn't think you could do. I remember the last time I added weight to my squat. I remember when I took a spin class with a difficulty rating over nine, because I tend to prefer ones between seven and eight. I remember that high ropes course when I thought, no way. I regularly expose myself to those experiences that push me a little bit outside my comfort zone, physically, as I practice for pushing myself outside of my comfort zone mentally and emotionally. Every day I hit the gym or go for a walk or get on the spin bike or stretch that little bit further, I am training for the challenges of high-conflict co-parenting life. And last, but absolutely not least, it allows me to show my kids how important looking after yourself is. Taking the time for yourself to look after your health is something that women struggle with. We seem to think, and have often been raised to think, that our number one purpose is to look after everyone else first and us second. Problem is, that often means we have no energy left for us and we end up neglecting ourselves. I did an episode a couple of months ago called When Being a Healthy Mom Has Nothing to Do With Your Kids. In it, I talk in depth about this and how important it is to look after ourselves in order to show up in the best way for our kids. If you haven't had the chance to listen, you can find that episode at healthymomafterdivorce.com slash three. If you're like me, I want to show my kids that self-care is not selfish. It's vital to our health and survival. It's vital to our ability to handle and move through stressful situations. It's vital to our mental well-being and emotional health. It's vital to living a long and balanced life. And every time my kids ask me if they can use the gym or the spin bike or go for a walk, I know that I am doing right by them. They are learning ways to be healthy and are learning that prioritizing themselves is important. 
This is one of the ways I am prepping them for life and all the good, bad, and everything in between it brings. Recently, I recorded an episode called When Trying to Protect Your Kids May Not Be What's Best for Them that talks all about working to prepare our kids instead of just trying to protect them from all the hard things in life. Them learning to look after their physical health is definitely preparing them and teaching them how to manage the stresses of life. That episode is well worth the listen and can be found at healthymomafterdivorce.com slash nine. So although I can list all of the physical reasons why I look after myself physically, like sleeping better, regulating my stress hormones, stronger muscles, better heart health, increased bone density, being leaner and fitter, wearing my favorite clothes again, those aren't the things that get me back every day. The things that actually get me over the day-to-day mental hurdles are actually the ways it helps me be a healthy mom after divorce and co-parenting with a high-conflict person. Maybe they will be for you too. And if you could use some help figuring out how to incorporate daily activity into your life and a few healthy habits that would work for you to set yourself up for success in all facets of divorce co-parenting life, I am ready when you are. You can find all the ways to work with me on my website. All right, healthy mamas, chin up, shoulders back, deep breath, and lace up those runners. Let's play the long game together because healthy moms raise healthy kids. Thank you so much for listening. Please leave a review. And if you like what you heard, share this episode with other moms. Don't forget to follow me on social media And if you want to learn more about me and what else I have to offer, head over to HealthyMomAfterDivorce.com. I can't wait to connect with you.